Linda McDonald and Jean Sarson are feminist activists and human rights educators who have been pushing for decades to insist that the public confront the related realities of femicide and non-state torture. Their work led them to co-found the organization, Persons Against Non-State Torture, a radical advocacy group that demands we recognize the everyday forms of abuse and domination in the domestic sphere that go criminally unnoticed. In response to the devastating and unprecedented act of mass murder that occurred here in Nova Scotia on April 18th and 19th, they're devoting their time and energy to a fiercely important media campaign to spread the message that we must now adopt what they term a feminist lens for understanding the misogynistic roots of the rampage and a feminist framework for seeing this series of attacks as part of a continuum of male aggression connected to related acts of mass violence that we've witnessed in recent memory. We discuss the ways that they've come to understand the conditions that produce human evil, the power of language for reshaping society, and the hope that a feminist framework can offer in the current moment where grief and trauma converge to link struggles and open onto a radically different future if, as they say, we believe in the possibility of change. Before I ask my first question, uh, I just wanted to briefly say that the title of this podcast feels, in a sense, inappropriate. It's not the most important thing that we need to discuss, of course, but as I reflect on it, this title that I've given the podcast, Pretty Heady Stuff, does not fit the extreme gravity of the issue that we're here to address. That said, I I wanted to say, you know, the title is actually meant to do a couple of things. First, I'm trying to signal that I'm particularly drawn to people that are working to communicate complex and urgent ideas. And then second, the title is meant to critique what I see as the often anti-intellectual nature of our current age, and maybe even apolitical nature of our current age, in which engagement with serious subjects or complex ideas is sort of dismissed, and I think in some cases even ridiculed by fragile figures of patriarchal authority in particular. Uh, These ideas that we care about are seen as too much of a challenge to society, I think, um, to the comfortable persistence of these everyday forms of violence. So it gets reduced to heady stuff or heavy stuff, things that are just not worth reckoning with, or I don't know, that are too complicated to integrate into our everyday practices. I like your title because I think it's kind of uh, catchy and, uh, you know, it'll catch people that maybe wouldn't necessarily listen to these topics. They'd be curious. And uh, I've been told all my life that I talk about too, too heavy things. You know, that's oh, Linda, that's a that's a pretty heavy conversation to be having so early in the morning or, you know, this is a party. And so that's been kind of. Um, part of my reality. And so I see it as a pun, a pun of that. And it's like, well, it is, but we have to hear it. Yeah. And that question of sort of timeliness too early in the morning, you know, to engage with this, like, when is the right time is the the question, I think, you know, we, we like to formalize our engagement with these subjects. I think what the work that you and others have done to make this part of the conversation is what I'm really interested in. Well, see, that when is the right time is, is a way to silence people, isn't it? That's a statement. And they used it with the uh, shooting. You know, it's not the right time to talk about, you know, the RCMP uh, practices. It's not the right time to talk about whether male violence against women is involved. It's not the right time. So in my opinion, when there's people, pr- primarily women and girls, the, the people that uh, Jean and I are advocating more the most, it's always the right time because every day I get up, I know that there's children suffering. And if I, if I try to find the right time for me to talk about their suffering, it's always right. It's always the right time because they're suffering every minute of every day. Uh, uh, you write in your article for First Light about how in 1982, Margaret Mitchell, one of the few women uh, members of parliament, started her statement to the House of Commons by simply stating facts. She she told the House that the parliamentary report on battered wives states that one in 10 Canadian husbands beat their wives regularly. Instead of being met with sympathy or shock, the statistic was met inexplicably, you, you write, with male shouts and anger. 
that drowned out the rest of the report. What is it about this form of misogynistic, discriminatory, and prejudicial laughter, I'm quoting you again, that makes it such an important tool of non-state and state torturers? And how is it indicative, from your perspective, of a broad inability to engage with the gravity and severity of the everyday violences faced by women in this country and elsewhere? The thing is about laughter, um, laughter comes with a tone. And when it's a misogynistic tone, it's a put down, it's uh, the humiliation, it's the objectification, it's the dismissal of a person as another equal human being. And when I was thinking of of the women, uh, often in the initial uh, stages, if you will, of recovery, like Linda and I could not laugh, even though some, some things may have been funny to us. But because the women had only had laughter from the point of view of tone that was misogynistic mm-hmm. and a put down, they weren't at the stage of recovery that they could distinguish uh, laughter that was just that was just person to person and just funny. And as the healing or has or as the recovery happens, then they can start laughing and then they can start enjoying laughing. And even they will say, I really like to hear you laugh because they they can incorporate that idea that it's okay. The tool of non-state and state tortures, their intent is to destroy the person that they're they're torturing. That it's intentional, it's directed that way. Laughter is one of their tools to achieve that. And actually in some of, in the research that we've done, uh, I was looking at uh, seven, 77 questionnaires uh, a couple nights ago, and one of the uh, questions that we ask in the questionnaire is whether they were treated as non-human. And out of those 77, 99% said they were treated as non-human. They don't even have a concept that they have a relationship with themselves. We have a model that we use to help them start to understand. And what is significant in that is that they know that the misogynistic laughter sticks to them like crazy glue. That emotional dehumanization, it is so intense and so strong that it continues to put the put them down and down and down because that emotion is is so intense. If you're it's that group think. So many of the women that have shared their stories with us were um, victimized by a group of people. So when you put that tone plus a group of people who are using that tone, the degree of dehumanization goes goes up. So even with the politicians, uh, if you put that group think, that group um, ideology to maintain patriarchy, to dismiss violence. That laughter, it's like the peer group, they all join each other to maintain the status quo, in this case, patriarchy, and maintain the oppression of women, and also never hold patriarchy to account. It's such a a powerful statement, Jean, that you made about laughter as a kind of weapon, um, but also as a different kind of tool, a tool of healing. The decision to laugh, the decision not to laugh, these are these are decisions that, as you say, have impact. And can I add one more thing to that? So the, the laughter, um, how we learned, uh, you know, it was so dominant. The women talked about the hurt, most of the, the worst hurt was their laughter. And I, you know, I pictured these little girls being tortured by a large group of adults and then laughing at the the little girl and how horrible that would feel. But what we learned from the laughter was that it's also a sign of their pleasure, of the perpetrator's pleasure. So laughter is such a cruel, it's so cruel. And 
to think that, you know, you can use laughter in that way in Parliament or it, it shows that they also had pleasure probably in, in putting Margaret down. And that that adds another dimension to the patriarchy. This article that you uh, that you co-wrote on the spillover of violence from military culture into the domestic sphere, you call this a, a ritualistic kind of violence that's a concept that's crucial for understanding the disturbing place of pleasure in producing relationships of sexualized domination. Uh, but I wondered if you could, either of you, speak to why it seems to be so difficult to communicate this kind of idea to the public. Is it something we simply don't want to believe that uh, the decision to laugh can be a tool weaponized to subordinate? You know, you're absolutely correct that people, when Linda and I talk about pleasure, it's like, how can this be? How can it be that we have those who walk among us who have pleasure um, in the destruction of another human being? And it was a, it was a question that Linda and I had to um, come to ourselves, really, as individuals. Because when the first woman came in 1993... I mean, very quickly, we were understanding that she was talking about torture. And it was a new, it was a new thought. I'll speak for myself. It was a new thought for me. I mean, I, you know, I'm very open that I was born into family violence and I knew about um, domestic violence and, you know, watching my father beat my mother up and, you know, how much we would try to, and I can even relate to the woman in, in, who was the um, partner of the mass murderer um, last month, you know, when she hid in the woods. That was a technique my mother and my siblings and I devised, trying to get out of the house and hide in the woods until he, un, until he went unconscious and it was safe to go home. I, I think we have to start that close to home with understanding that those who commit acts of violence, there is a, a, a form of pleasure, whether that pleasure is maintaining power and control, whether that pleasure is a sexualized power and control. We were very strong in understanding that non-state torturers have pleasure because the women kept telling us that. Even as little children, they said, we knew that they were having pleasure, the way they looked at us, the way they laughed at us, um, the way they had uh, sexualized uh, torture pleasures. So that was a search we had to go into. Mm. And um, I guess it was a valuable search in some ways because we had to define our own belief system about acts of human evil. We had to take away that whole thought that human evil is a spiritual thing. We had to go to the studies that say evil is a human action. Um, mm. And we had to look at the, the work of people who looked at, say, the Holocaust and the perpetrators uh, that went on there. They're looking at their actions. Erwin Saab, he wrote The, uh, the Roots of uh, Evil, which was a book that I found really important to, to me to understand what uh, we were uh, dealing with. And, in, and then later there was um, research by, I don't know if you've heard of him, Michael Wilner. Uh, he's in the United States, and he and co-authors ended up um, doing work and did uh, a lot of evaluation online. Actually, up to 40,000 people participated in their first uh, forensic science project involved to see what people thought about acts of human evil. And they spelled out through this research 25 issues that would look at a person, look at their actions. Do their actions meet this criteria? Of these 20, uh, 25 issues. And that was very helpful for us because his work comes very clearly to look at the issues of pleasure and the fact that they have pleasure in often prolonging the misery of another human being that they are destroying. 
so that's where the ritualistic can come in. We had one woman, her torture victimization didn't happen until she was an adult, so her childhood, she said, was fairly normal. But to be fairly graphic here, her husband, who groomed her and then tricked her and with three other men, um, held her captive and tortured and trafficked her, prostituted her for four and a half years before she escaped. When her husband first tricked her into being captive of the three other men, along with himself, um, they gang raped her, but he never raped her again orally or vaginally. But he raped her, his ritual was pleasure to rape her with a wine bottle anally uh, she would hemorrhage so he did that repeatedly and the only way we can understand why a person would do that we have to understand that they are satisfying their own pleasure and he used to say to her she said keep your eyes open bitch because i like to see i like to see the misery that she was experiencing so I, I think the issue of pleasure, we all have to decide uh, where we stand with actions of another human being. And if they go along the continuum into the reality of um, human evil, we have to be comfortable in admitting our species has that capacity. And, and define it as a capacity. Linda, did you want to follow? Yeah. Um, what happened when I started hearing the stories, I had a, I had a friend that had, had described some torture that her parents had perpetrated on her, her and her sister when she was little. So I had an, I had a little inkling of something that, like this, but I had no idea how prevalent it was until Jean and I started listening to the stories and the detail of it. I only had snippets from my friend. What I had to do is I just had to flatten the structures and forget about whether it was state or non-state what building it happened in, what role a person had, what uniform they had on, what dress, and just look at every the world as people, and that some people torture in a police station and some people torture in the house. Some people can be police and some people can be parents. And that's what changed it for me because, like, why wouldn't it be that some parents torture? Because you know, there's, there's evil people in every walk of life. There's evil people in the police. There's evil people in the priesthood. So why wouldn't there be evil parents? You know, that, that's how I had to think about it. And that changed my worldview, really. And I had to understand that some parents, they have children, they bring them into the world specifically to torture them and to traffic them to make money. And once I did that, I, I was fine. I, and I didn't have fear about it. I don't know why, but I know a lot of people do. They really have fear. And that's why I think they don't want to hear about it, because it scares them to think that the world is like that, I think. But I understood that just because I was hearing these stories about these women who had been tortured and through ritualistic torture sometimes and sometimes not because it depended on the pleasure of the perpetrator. The ritualistic, just like Jean said, it enhanced it more and it also terrified the children more so that they, they couldn't tell. Or the, the way they told made them sound like they were mentally ill. So it was a tool that the perpetrators used. But I, I wasn't at any risk just because I was hearing those stories. And this is what people have to understand. It might be upsetting to hear about it, but just because you're hearing of another person's torture doesn't mean it's going to happen to you. You know, these are stories that happen to them as children or, you know, and the more you know about a, a crime, the safer you are. So silence doesn't stop the violence. So the more that I, I learned, the more we talk about it, the safer we are. So that's the idea of pushing through the fear of, you know, not wanting to hear the stories or not wanting to know that the world is like this. Well, the more we keep it silent, the more risks our, our children have because they're going to grow up and marry a torturer, you know, be fooled by a psychopath. Or we're going to live next door to a, a parents that torture and our child is going to go over and start playing with their child and, and may get harmed. So, the, you know, knowledge is power with, with torture and non-state torture. And this is what Jean and I have been trying to explain to people. The more we understand, the better the world will be. And I do believe that this is one of the worst crimes against humanity and that we're not going to evolve as a species, as a human species, until we 
understand non-state torture very clearly. What I'm hearing is that there are these different modes of receiving the reality of this. There's fear. There's, I think, a, a kind of sick fascination. But then I think there's this third mode that you're both kind of models of that is a, a drive to fully understand structurally, individually, and so on, uh, to develop terms to understand uh, where this comes from, the, the horrors. And you know, on that point, I, I had a question about Chris Harmon's book, People's History of the World, which talks about this idea of a kind of unchanging human nature, a prejudice, he says, like this, this idea of an unchanging human nature is a prejudice, he says, that pervades a lot of academic writing, mainstream journalism and pop culture alike. You know, the story we're told is that human beings have, in general, always been greedy, competitive and aggressive, um, and that that's really what explains horrors like war, exploitation, slavery and the oppression of women. But what I'm hearing is that uh, both of you are, are invested in a feminist lens for rewriting that kind of just general perception of people as universally prone to violence. You're saying that we can actually narrate history differently and, and still you know, reckon with the individual evil actions of people. That's why I was um, so keen on uh, hearing you uh, speak and speaking with you and trying to think through these things with you. Um, because there, it seems like there is a, a, a force now, a feminist force uh, for fully understanding these acts of violence as undeniably evil, but you know, understand them as coming from a particular place, a, a patriarchal, misogynistic society. Uh, any follow-up, though, uh, Jean or, or Linda, on anything that yeah, we've been talking about to this point? I'm, I'm certainly having to come to understand human evil did not, uh, it made me comfortable, if you will, because then I knew what I was confronted by. It didn't make me fearful. It didn't make me discouraged. It did. It probably made me hopeful, and it probably grounded me um, very clearly in a sense of knowing and understanding exactly uh, what we were confronted with. And because the model I have around social formation, if you will, um, it, it fit very well into the model that that kind of maintains how I see patriarchal society, how the structure is maintained. And it just, it just fits so easily into my construct that um, that's exactly... Uh, a very hopeful perspective to know that we can change that framework. We know that that's a possibility. We just have to be really truthful and stand uh, with truth and stand with knowledge and stand with the right language, and uh, we can change that. I don't think I don't think we're cloned into having to maintain uh, patriarchy as it has been over centuries. And I'd, I'd just like to add, um, I didn't really understand evil before I started this work because I was brought up Roman Catholic and uh, I walked away from the church. But what I didn't understand is I had, in, you know, internalized a belief in evil that was still, you know, very, very, very deep in me. So I had to dig that out in this process, which was very liberating. And so I know that I can do it. Other people can do it as well. But, you know, what I really clarified for myself was that evil is not as powerful force that swoops in and takes over us as human beings. It's not a contagious disease that we'll catch by sitting and talking to somebody else who's had terrible evil acts perpetrated against them. That evil is a, a learned behavior and that children are not born evil. I don't believe that for one second. So if it's a learned behavior, we can unlearn it as a species. But it's to really grapple with what evil is and um, not to think that people are mentally ill because all of these perpetrators that we know, they were highly functioning adults in highly um, prestigious jobs. And they were going out and, and very skillfully hiding what they were doing. So it was, certainly had nothing to do with mental illness either. So I just see evil as a human behavior that some people either choose at a certain age to, to cross that line or they were taught it as a child and have to unlearn it. 
I wanted to just briefly quote the poet, feminist, and civil rights activist, Audre Lorde, who wrote that, quote, anger is often dismissed as irrational, useless, unproductive, and immature. But, but from Lorde's perspective, anger is a, quote, completely rational and powerful response to this violence, because as she says, speaking specifically now, of, she's talking about racist violence, but she's articulating an intersectional feminism. You know, she says, every woman has a well-stocked arsenal of anger, potentially useful against those oppressions, personal and institutional, which brought that anger, their anger into being. And uh, in a recent manifesto titled Feminism for the 99%, Nancy Fraser and others talk about this rising tide of movements globally that are really built on a collective anger um, that is now, you know, as the manifesto puts it, becoming a massive tide, a global feminist movement. Do you think that uh, a growing awareness of the fact that gender violence, as the manifesto puts it, is found in every period of capitalist development, but becomes especially virulent and pervasive in times of crisis? Do you think that that is part of the the, the conversation already, uh, part of the source of anger, or are we still too driven to individualize these acts as individual acts of violence that don't have this kind of background of a uh, you know, masculinity and normative masculinity that in fact celebrates certain forms of domination. Any, any thoughts on um, anger in particular as a response or? I think I've been angry all my life in some ways. Uh, understanding that my father's violence was wrong. Understanding that society uh, was wrong for not standing up. Um, and angry when society kind of wanted to say pathologize me as a child because i was having trouble kind of figuring out how do you heal from emotional uh, victimization um so to me it's always always been healthy it's never been anything that uh, i ever questioned um but, and I think the time right now, I, I think the whole idea of feminism and feminine uh, thought has grown exponentially around the world. So I think there is a collective anger uh, for women and uh, men who are supportive of the feminist uh, progression. Um, and I think it's a fuel that you need in order to stand because if you didn't have it, I think you'd be weak at the knees and um, not be able to uh, maintain the energy that it's going to take to push, even in the province of Nova Scotia, to push for an inquiry with a feminist lens. Back when I was doing the master's program and came in with a whole um, perspective of healthy anger and lo looking at the professor who was shocked because she was of, of the thought that for somehow anger is a negative emotion instead of a positive emotion if it's uh, used for the right reasons. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're talking, I have to interject a little bit around the voices of women who have brought Linda and I to this reality of non-state torture, because of course, right now they're not in this conversation with Linda, you and I, mm -hmm. but their knowing is with me in this conversation. That women, whether they were little girls or, or older, they had reason to be terrified of anger because of the violence, the torture that was coming at them. There's a catch-22 in that because when they're coming to recovery, they have, they've been taught to, to be terrified of their own emotion and terrified of anger. So, of course, as they're recovering and realizing what happened to them, what was done to them, and how society either ignored or didn't know or didn't want to believe uh, what they were enduring, when they start seeing that and they start feeling anger, then th there's a couple things that happen. Often they go to self-harming to try to mute 
uh, the emotion. So it takes a progression to finally understand you have the right to, they have the right to be angry. They have the right to have that free expression. They have the right to use that to stand. And it's, it's tough to stand for them because what comes at them is more rejection, but they have to learn that their anger is right, their anger is normal, their anger is justified, and how to work with such massive anger becomes the next issue. But I have to put in here in this conversation just exactly how complex uh, your question is about anger and when we relate it to uh, non-state torturers and uh, those that they torture. Yeah. So uh, Jean's talking from the perspective of herself and um, the survivors, the women. And, and it re we have to remember they started out often, many of them, as babies. That's the So they were harmed from the time they were babies. So I, I'm going to talk about um, how, what I learned about anger for myself and then as an activist, the other side of it, the activist side of it. So I, I, I can't remember when I wasn't angry because I knew my father was wrong and the violence and I knew my mother was wrong and the narcissism, although I was more confused because it's, I think it's more confusing to figure out narcissism than it is to understand the physical violence and how wrong that is. But what happened to me is I started internalizing that anger and blaming myself unconsciously for everything that was going on because I couldn't stop it. You know, I tried to stop my parents' behavior. And of course, as a child, you rarely have success at that. So because <clears throat> they didn't change their behavior, I felt like a failure. This was all unconscious. So when I met Jean, one of the questions she asked me early on, she said, are, are you angry? And I said, oh, no, I'm not, not angry, you know, not really. And she said, well, you sure? And I said, well, yeah, I'm angry. And she said, who are you angry at? And then it hit me like a ton of bricks. I was angry at myself. So here I was in my 30s and had carried that anger, self-anger around for a long time. And that was very destructive. So I think that feminists and any activist has to be really careful who they're angry at. Because I certainly didn't realize it was me until I dove in there. But once I redirected that anger out into the social, everything changed for me. And like Jean said, anger is healthy. I believe it's very healthy. I don't think of it as a negative emotion. I mean, I wouldn't teach my granddaughters not to be angry because if I did, then if someone hurt them, it would, um, it would inhibit their sense of righteousness to be able to, to uh, speak back or to uh, get protection or to just say no. And so righteous anger is a very healthy force and I see it as a friend. I really do. I feel my anger is one of my best friends. And I feel it as the fire within me that gives me the energy and the caring and the courage because I don't have fear. I really don't have fear in what I'm doing. And I'm sure it's because my anger gives me that sense of purpose. And I, I can't imagine living my life without a righteous and healthy anger. I just wouldn't be able to do this work. And it's given me such a quality in my life. So it's foreign to me when, when people talk about how they're afraid of their anger and, or how women shouldn't be angry. I understand why they say that. Because, of course, what's more dangerous than a person that doesn't have fear? So the more we can claim our anger in a respectful way, I think as activists, the more, the more momentum we can build to help make change. I feel complicit in a culture that uh, weaponizes anger in particular ways, I have to admit. I, and and the description of the right to use anger that, Gene, you talk about, the right to use it in order to stand, that is very different from, of course, using anger as a means of sustaining forms of domination, which I have seen in my life. It's making me, to use your, your phrase, you know, weak at the knees, simply like hearing you two talk about this. But um, to build on just something you said, uh, Linda, um, that that notion of courage comes up in the the letter that you collectively wrote, um, you know, demanding that the that the mass shooting be recognized as as femi femicide. You demand, in particular, that we recognize the enormous courage it takes to name misogyny and femicide and speak out against it. 
um, it takes a certain amount of courage. And it, it sounds like you're also saying it, it, it takes being encouraged to uh, use anger as, as you say, as a gift in order to like develop the courage to speak out of, about these things in that, you know, in that press release, that letter that you wrote as a group of Nova Scotian feminists, you, you demand that these horrific acts of violence um, uh, be interpreted in terms of, yeah, this, this notion of uh, femicide, this, this word that changes our entire way of looking at violence, I would say. And so if this is to be the time when women and intersectional coalitions vocally fight back, I guess my question would be, what kind of courage does it require? What kind of radical feminism from your perspective is built on, on courage? What language perhaps is necessary to actively adopt a feminist lens here? Because the language that seems to dominate reproduces a deep desire to just reduce these acts of violence to senseless tragedies and the people who commit them to lone wolves. But, you know, you're sort of saying, I think that this, that sort of language is dangerous. It distracts us from femicide. So any, any thoughts on, I guess, the courage um, that it requires to name femicide as such um, and what the power is in, in employing the term? Well, for me, um, if you're just thinking about using language, mm -hmm. to me, language is critical to naming truth. And for me, things like language, words that say lone wolf, all that does is dismiss the truth. And it's been language that, patriarchal language, that has uh, does two things. Patriarchal language dismisses the truth, but it also, on the other hand, upholds uh, patriarchy. So the courage to really say in one word, in this case, femicide, it challenges the construct of patriarchy. And at the same time, it means that even say, if we will, that patriarchy is male domination and female uh, oppression. It really also requires that women who are in that position of oppression have to stand and they have to look, we have to look at ourselves and say, okay, are we following uh, misogyny too? Are we also part of the oppression of other women? So, yes, language like femicide challenges not only patriarchy males, if you will, it also uh, challenges females of how we're going to look at uh, designing a, a, new, a new reality. I, I'll say that um, if we change our language, then we change our understanding and then we eventually change our behavior. And I'm just driven because I can't get it out of my mind. I, I, I know the reporters, they kept going on about this mass shooting is senseless and that we live in this idyllic province and he was a nice guy. All those pat statements that we've had to maintain the myths, to hide, hide the violence that exists everywhere, not just in Nova Scotia. This is not unique to Nova Scotia, but we, we have all these pat sayings that we use to maintain the patriarchy. But then it went to another level when I was watching the press conference with the RCMP. And we have these trusted officials who are investigating this horrible crime and he identifies it as senseless. I thought, well, where's the hope? I have, if I got hope that they're gonna look into the reasons and really get to the intentionality of this man if they're calling it senseless. I mean, we have to make sense of mass shootings. The research shows us that you know, the majority of mass shootings are rooted in male violence against women, which leads to femicide. So it can't be described as, as senseless, not by the police anyways. And then when he was asked a question about whether um, misogyny was any part, any element in the crime, and he said no. And yet at the same conference, he talks about how the woman, the first woman attacked, endured a significant assault. So those two statements can't exist in the same reality. One of them is untrue. And it is just untrue that it isn't rooted in, in misogyny. 
So, and then that evolves into femicide and mass shooting. So what I'm really hoping is, is if we can get femicide into the everyday language in this province and through an inquiry, and it's in the news a lot more, and hopefully people will use it as everyday language, then it'll start changing our thinking that actually in this country, not in the global South, but in this country, a girl or woman is killed every two and a half days simply because she is female. That's a simple statement. It's a horrific reality and it's femicide. And this is the life, this is the world that your children and my grandchildren live in. So naming it will make a better world for them. And my hope is that yes, femicide will become an everyday word and we won't have to ask anymore, what does it mean? It seems like these um, horrific high profile events of, of mass violence are finally perhaps being connected to one another and, and waking the public up to the persistence of this kind of, as Al Jones puts it, this kind of background of especially white male aggression. It seems to be urgent now more than ever. Like on some level, in the wake of this specific massacre and in the face of an increasing number of attacks, like the one two years ago in Toronto, where Alec Manassian drove a van into pedestrians, largely targeting women and justifying his rampage as an act directed at women for their perceived sexual rejection of him. You know, it seems like now is, as I said, kind of like the urgent right time to articulate this radical position on the reasons for these murders, um, a causality that identifies, as you're doing, their roots in, uh, as Jude McCulloch and Jane Marie Mayer put it in their article, the intimate connection between mass shooting and violence against women in particular. Um, do, you, do you feel like there is this, um, this moment now where uh, a global feminist movement is able to, it feels crass to simply call it a moment of opportunity, but to look at these high profile instances of mass violence as precisely the moment one needs to intervene? Is, is there hope to be derived from people making these kinds of connections and, and people like yourselves being invited to make a radical argument for their, their actual roots in a kind of causal framework of misogyny and patriarchy? That's how I feel. We can either jump in fully to try to shift uh, the future, or if we backed off, I would say I'd have to be guilty, if you will, of not see not seizing the moment. And, and yes, I, I feel I feel very strongly that this is, I guess, what you call a teachable moment in, mm -hmm. in a global perspective, global meaning. Nova Scotia, Nova Scotia is small enough. Maybe if we can shift it here, we can then pass it on to other places. Um, I agree completely. And uh, I wanted to, um, you know, uh, uh, foreground the, the words of a prominent Nova Scotian feminist who is, is relentless in making these subjects a, a, a you know, topic of public conversation, Judy Haven, um, who wrote a week ago in the Nova Scotian Advocate, there are, that there are many reasons that we need to keep pushing for a feminist lens to understand the crimes of mass murderers one of the examples that she cites is the backlash against Dr. Adrian Weinacht, a sociology professor at Mount Allison University, who attempted to present this idea that the murder-suicide of Lionel Desmond in 2017 was not an isolated incident, but part of larger trends in intimate partner violence. Um, and Weinacht asks, why didn't Desmond take his own life, just his own? Where in his life did he learn that it was up to him to take the lives of the three women he was most close to? It was met with a certain kind of outrage that this feminist lens was too political, too one-sided, or even somehow unethical, right? It inspired outrage. How do we account for the hostility that tends to get directed at these kinds of feminist frameworks for violence? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that naming is a part of the power of... Uh, uh, posing a different reality. And, you know, words have so much power, that's why they're silenced. And um, if I look at, I think of femicide on a continuum. Patriarchy is a breeding ground. 
for the hatred or the misogyny of women. You know, boys and girls are born in this world. My son was born like my daughters. He wasn't born to hate women any more than my daughters were. And he didn't grow up hating women because he was taught a different way at home, even though the patriarchal messages were all around him. He luckily we we got through it that he's a he's not a misogynist male and I'm very proud of that. So it's patriarchy is that breeding ground for misogyny or the hatred of, of girls and, and uh, women. And then of course from the misogyny comes the male violence and that's where the the shooter comes in with his male violence against women. And then he acted out on it with an act of femicide and then the resulting homicide from that and then the mass shooting. So patriarchy brings us right through to the mass shooting and that it's to see all those pieces together and that naming of feminism. And that's why it was important for us to name ourselves as feminists fighting femicide because feminism is a way through to a, you know, a different, a different solution. Feminism gives us a prevention of all these atrocities. It gives a prevention of femicide. It gives us a prevention of mass shootings. It gives us a prevention of white male privilege you know, because he was white and, and very privileged and male. You know, a black man wouldn't have been able to own four police cars and it, it not go unnoticed or not reported. So yes, femicide is a very powerful word. And I'm very proud that, um, you know, we we're hearing it more in the news and uh, the deputy prime minister talked about femicide and then femininicide, which is another word I hadn't heard until she, she said it. I guess it was Myrna Dawson the first time I heard it from the Canadian Femicide Observatory, which was uh, from South South America, which was the it's the state ignoring femicide, and that's what will happen here if if we don't get a public inquiry and we don't get the femicide included in the public inquiry, then our country, our province, will be uh, perpetuating feminine femininicide. And that's very crucial for us to start to stop that process. And we can't do it without the naming. Um, to, you know, uh, I think connect it to uh, a recent book by Judith Butler, who is, you know, um, a feminist theorist. You know, her book, The Force of Nonviolence, names femicide. And in particular, she talks about South America, Latin America, um, and the pandemic of feminicidio as it's termed, so violence directed at women and women identified uh, people. You know, she, she knows the statistic, three, almost 3,000 people every year um, killed in Latin America as it can be named feminicidio. And she, Butler writes powerfully, for example, about the question of shock and the timeliness of intervention. Uh, and I wanted to briefly quote her if I could. She says, Often the deaths from feminicidio are reported as sensationalistic stories, after which there is a momentary shock and then it happens again. There's horror, but it's not always linked with an analysis and a mobilization that focuses collective rage. The systemic character of this violence is effaced when the men who commit such crimes are said to suffer personality dis disorders or singular pathological conditions. I think, Jean, you were talking about this. Um, and Butler says the same effacement happens when a death is considered tragic as it's confl as, as if conflicting forces in the universe led to an unfortunate conclusion. What's interesting to me in, in that section of the force of nonviolence though, is that Butler does not talk about the reality of femicide in, in Canada and other countries of the global North. Do you think that um, that is changing? And do you also think perhaps that you know, relegating this kind of violence to the global South um, creates an, an easy borderline um, that we should destabilize. You know, why might we need to look more locally at the realities of what Butler calls machista violence or misogynistic violence? I think absolutely it is not a, a global South issue. And dealing... Uh, with our government over time, because um, as you know, we've been doing this since 1993. I've had to come to look at our political structure and absorb into my knowing that uh, I have come to say we have within our political so-called democratic structure, uh, political cruelty, because 
It has not mattered how many times Linda and I have given expert testimony to uh, committees, uh, federal committees, justice committee, and brought women's detailed stories to them. There is still a dismissal of what we are saying. And it's not because the knowledge that they do not have, they do have the knowledge. So we're advanced enough, in my opinion, to be able to say, okay, we now know we have the knowledge. And even in one uh, presentation, one of the MPs said, well, where's the evidence? You know, well, there's no law, so there's no evidence in that form. But I said to her, well, the center uh, out of Winnipeg that looks at the sexualized exploitation online has the evidence in the fact that they are saying 20 to 25 percent of children under the age of eight within that range from newborns to the age of eight. Uh, they know that they suffer uh, a certain percentage of them, 20 to 25 percent that um, are surviving torture that is trafficked online. So they have those videos, that's evidence. And that was dismissed. So I cannot look the other way and say, okay, our country does not know this is happening. They do know, they have that evidence, they have what Linda and I have shared repeatedly with them, met with them, talked to them, giving them the data that we have had, and there's no place for it because they don't have a law, so they don't even have made, they have not made space for us to even um, give them the questionnaire results that we have. So it's a dismissal, and the only way that I can come to understand it for myself in a way that I'm comfortable, if you will, with the knowledge that there's willful dismissal, and I call that political cruelty. Other researchers have called it institutional betrayal, and the fact, explaining it, that institutions, say like the Justice Committee, we would hope would be trustworthy to hear what we had to say and to willfully take in what we were saying, um, versus rejecting what we were saying, even though they may say, well, we've heard this, but we can't, we can't do anything about the law because it will uh, distract from state torture. So that's a minimization to me of women. It's a femicidal, if you will, um, rejection that we have to look at just exactly how our society is minimizing ignoring, invisibilizing the reality. We have to fit what the South is saying into the North. I wanted to ask about the, the politics of mourning, in a sense, the politics of grief here at the you know, unbelievable loss of life, life caused by this one man in Nova Scotia, uh, a man, as I say, I will not name and none of us are, are willing to name for, because it is the policy of feminists in this province to deny him a kind of posthumous fame for these acts. But that's just one aspect of the politics of mourning. I wanted to ask, though, about the politics of mourning one of the many deaths in particular. Heidi Stevenson was killed in the line of duty. And I've noticed that there's been a, an especially politicized element to the mourning of her death as an RCMP officer. It's a difficult subject, um, but I wanted to ask, do you think that the normative, conventional, and maybe even ritualistic approach to mourning a police officer is misleading in this case. What do you think are the implications of just adopting the standard attitude of enshrining this person as a police officer first and as a woman second? Does it subtly celebrate the culture of policing that the murderer was clearly fixated upon? And, and what kind of power would it have if we were to actively insist upon fem femicidal violence for a term used in the work of mourning Heidi Stevenson in particular. The issue of having a ritualistic pattern of, if you will, mourning forms of violence that uh, is inflicted against patriarchal structures, if you will. I mean, 
police is a patriarchal structure. I mean, every structure in my mind that carried power and control of the social reality is, is male dominated, whether it's firefighters, whether it's police, whether um, it's military, all those male dominating structures have a strong ritual that is uh, re that reinforces patriarchy. The women had to fight to become firefighters. Women had to fight to say they could become police officers. Women had to women work heavily in the military and they were invisible too. So when I every say Remembrance Day, I think about this. I think. Okay, we're celebrating um, the victory of war and fighting, which was really a, it's a male-dominated uh, process. And if I was to say, well, why don't we start celebrating, if you will, if you want to call it celebrating, the mourning of every femicidal death in this country. We'd be doing that every uh, two and a half days, if you will. If I was to suggest that, as an action that would present equality between the worlds of male domination and equally sane female domination, if you want to put them both in the middle, how would society take that? I would say they would not want to go there. So for me, it's a very complex question. How do I mourn that she was a woman and she was a policewoman? And I'm not sure that in the morning that the idea that it was, I think, an element of femicide in the way he killed her, the fact he shot her once and then took her weapon and shot her again. I think the degree of misogyny that went there is being ignored. And what is being ritually honored, if you will, is that she was a police person. They say police women, but I don't, woman, but I don't, I don't think that her femaleness, if you will, is really being identified uh, as the issue. I think it's the morning ritual is still uh, a reinforcement of patriarchy, which is painful in itself. You know, as you say, these institutions remain patriarchal, and so um, adopting a different kind of framework challenges them in some fundamental way. And especially at these highly sensitive times, uh, it, it becomes you know difficult, but I think important to do that. So, Glenda, did you want to follow up at all on that? Yeah, I think about Heidi a lot, and you know, she had such a beautiful energy. I never met her, but her pictures just speak so much to me about her. And the one that they show all the time is her walking with all those children. And I mean, that's not the normal image of an RCMP that we see a, a, a person walking with a happy face with all these happy children. So she's certainly had an energy uh, around the value of children, which speaks to her caring. And I, you know, I you just can't, it, it's, it's just emblazoned in my mind, that image of her. And um, I don't think it was a coincidence that he just ran right into her, head on into her car. I, I really believe that he was, he felt invincible with his bump bar and knew she didn't have one. And, you know, let's have at it. He, you know, and she's a, she, she's a woman first, but I think it's very obvious that her police person identity was presented first by the RCMP and by society and, and um, by the rituals that we did in the morning. And I think she's the same as all the other women that she was a target differently. And I think those two women shot on the side of the road, the two nurses, I, I'm a nurse and I used to drive a VON car and it could have been me, you know, turned, pulled over by a policeman. So you'd think, and then, you know, the woman walking, I don't think those were all coincidences that those were targets as well. I mean, they, he didn't know them, but I think he once, once he got on the thrill of the kill, he just went after as many women as he could find along the way, driven by his misogyny. And then I just think the whole idea of mourning, I mean, it's so, it's so sad to me. It, it gets sadder every day 
that one violent man could have caused so much destruction to so many for so long. I mean, we'll live with this reality in Nova Scotia forever now. The, the families impacted the most. But it's also a tragedy in how we mourn, I believe, because, you know, there's a glorification in the ritualizing of things. And then th that term Nova Scotia strong, it really bothers me because I think if we just said Nova Scotia caring or Nova Scotia supporting or something that wasn't that idea of keep a stiff upper lip and don't show your vulnerability. I mean, I know we can be strong, but in, in suffering, but strong often gives us a message of not crying or not feeling vulnerable and boys, we should feel all of those things to be able to find a solution through the morning, you know, be strong. I, I would never say that to someone when they lost someone they love. I would never say be strong. That's not the message I would want to give. Ride through the wave of grieving and let yourself feel whatever comes to you. I'm interested to hear what you have to say about the, the note that you make on your website for your the organization Persons Against Non-State Torture. Um, you, you note that your research takes the potentially questionable approach of encouraging women to describe the torture they've experienced in, in graphic detail. Um, you also talk about how women who speak to this experience have entrusted you with their stories and you clearly take this responsibility very seriously but i just wanted to ask whether you ever i suppose worry that um there is a kind of re-victimization that goes along with sharing the details of these torturous traumatic experiences i mean how do you understand your own responsibility in in your research exposing these kinds of facts very critical question for me. I'm not questioning it, but I know mm. um, the, the normative way of dealing with the issue questions it. And it comes right down to the language, very simply. Trauma is secondary. What is first is victimization. When someone has been tortured, there's been a crime committed against them. And I don't I can't say how many times we've been told over and over again by women, nobody ever told me that there was a crime committed against me. And even this morning, I got an email from a woman and she said, when you said, when Linda and I said, this is a crime, non-state torture is a crime. And like she said, nobody ever told me that. I never knew that there was a crime committed against me. A week and a half ago, Linda and I did a webinar to a, a group of persons who had survived a non-state torture victimization. And one woman said, she said, for 30 years I've been going to therapy and nobody ever told me that there was a crime committed against me. It was always I had to forget the crime and deal with the trauma. The trauma comes from a consequence of suffering or having been victimized by a, cr a crime. So that's why we always say victimization, traumatization, because a trauma, you can have an earthquake, you're not victimized, you have an earthquake, and that creates trauma. But we can't ignore what women have telling us. There was no literature out there that we could go to um, as far as non-state torture or victimization, it wasn't even a word or recognized. The literature on state torture, we started finding articles from other people who were supporting uh, individuals who had suffered state-inflicted torture, saying that the first thing they want to do is they want to tell of their victimization. They want somebody to hear they want somebody to understand. They want somebody to believe. And often the women draw images because it's like a show and tell. Do you see what happened to us? Do you see what was done to us? As much as we keep trying to share this point, and as much as the, the women and a few men that have come to us keep saying, nobody has ever said this, nobody acknowledges it. Everybody says, put it aside, just 
put it over there somewhere. And that's not how it works, at least not from our experience. What it does, it invalidates a person's victimization, the crime that they committed. And I think when I, when I read about the unfounded, it's the same thing. You know, forget about the crime. It couldn't have happened, or you're crazy, or you're mentally ill uh, to even be talking about those things. So if we are to change, if you will, femicide, we have to start really naming the crime for what it is and what it means and what the outcome is. So since Linda and I have been talking in the last few days in the interviews, we brought up strangulation. Okay, you can say strangulation, that is a crime, and then you have to understand the consequences of that crime. You have to understand that strangulation can cause death in minutes, or it may be a, bil a delayed death, or if it's a pattern of uh, victimization, chances are femicide will be the end result eventually. If we just want to ignore the crime of strangulation, to me, that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. People who are victimized do not have the right to speak and to be heard and to be understood for the crime that they suffered that was inflicted against them. Then we're never going to move ahead in the way that we need to use the language in an appropriate way to redefine men's violence against women. It's something that I hadn't really completely, I don't think, um, worked through the idea that victimization, traumatization, these are distinct things. Linda, did you want to build on that? So um, when Jean and I talk, we start off often by saying we don't apologize for what we're going to say. We, we don't, it's nothing we've done wrong. We're telling about a crime and it needs to be heard to be understood. You know, the details of the crime has to be, has to be spoken, not only for the survivors, because, you know, like Jean said, the research shows that especially uh, survivors of torture, they have to tell their whole story in order to heal because it's been so self-shattering. Their sense of self heals by telling their story, get it, getting the emotions out of their out of their bodies. Because when you tell your story, you release those emotions, all those feelings that you had at the time of the torturing. And in order for us to educate about what non-state torture is or what femicide is, any crime, people have to know the details of it. You can't just start talking about the traumatization of, uh, you know, the traumatization is we're left now with femicide with a, a grieving population, but that's not going to, if you were going to teach a person that had never heard of the word of femicide before, that's not going to teach them what the crime of femicide is. So it's the same with non-state torture. We have to describe what the crime is. You know, if you're, if you go into the police station to, to tell the police what your crime was you endured, you don't talk about how they're not going to really do anything with how shattered you are and that you can't function and that you can't work and you can't sleep. That's not going to take any, any weight in court. They have to be able to describe the crime that they endured. And that's the part that often uh, they're not able to do because they were so victimized and so pathologized and so drugged or whatever in society, they can't talk about their crime logically. And that's what we help them to do to clarify what, what the crime was, all the different kinds of crimes that they endured, whether it's water torture, electric shocking, all the same crimes in state torture. So that the, the detailing of the, of the victimization is very important. This week, there's been people contact us worried about the woman who came forward and described what she un understood as the neighbor. And they were so worried about how she's coping because she sounded emotional. Well, you can't talk about a crime, especially when you're first talking about it, without it being emotional. Because our emotions are tied into our memories of what that experience was like to witness. But the more you tell, the less emotion you have around it. You'll always go back to remembering the emotion and having some, but you won't be consumed by the terror or the 
fear or the anger or whatever your emotion is that you felt at the time of the crime, because some of that gets released as we keep telling about it. And what I find so upsetting about our culture is we keep talking about how we're re-traumatizing people by their telling. Now, I can understand it if they're in a patriarchal structure like the courtroom, and that's very victimizing again in itself. But if it's in a healing place or if it's in a, um, like a, the media where they have free reign to know that thousands of people are listening to them, that is so liberating to people that I, I, we, have seen, we have seen the difference when women can stand up and start telling their story, how they heal, how their brain heals, how their body heals. It's, it's just phenomenal. And in our culture, when we have people that are tra- victimized and traumatized, we take them off and into one room. And we sit them there with one person and we have an hour. We frame them into that hour and they're supposed to heal in that framework. Well, it doesn't work that way. Like with Jean and I, we were off in seven hours with women, you know, going from the beginning of that crime of that moment to the end of it. And we took them out into the environment. We took them to the park or we took them to a, a beautiful waterfall or something to talk about it. So it wasn't always a sterile place that they had to, you know, feels like there was something wrong with them. And I keep remembering that story of listening to um, victims of atrocity in Africa when a psychiatrist and psychologist came over to the to their country to help them heal from uh, the trauma that they had endured. And they said they got tired of sitting in a dark room talking to one person and they just told the white people to go home. And they said, we kept, we went back out into the world and cried together and talked together and danced together. And that's how they healed. And that's, that's the framework I think we need to have in our culture too, that it's not healing shouldn't be so secretive. Like I have a right to talk about what happened to me as a child and, and how it hurt me. And the more I've told it over the years, I, it has hardly any hold on me now at all. But if I kept silent about it and only talked about how I couldn't sleep at night or I, it affected how I ate, I would never have healed. So healing comes from the telling and it comes from our feeling our emotions and other people feeling with us, not our emotions, but their emotions of listening to us talking. We have a, in my opinion, we have a really sterile framework around healing. That's not, not going to release us from, from our, uh, from our trauma. Healing. You're right. I think is a kind of private, privatized, sterile, endeavor and for it not to be for it to be liberated for people to feel that they have the right to heal in 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 ways that are perhaps public and and make people uncomfortable would completely change the discourse and and the politics around femicide you have this article a recent article in which you talk about this the shadow pandemic of uh, increasing um, femicide under the covid 19 lockdown you're again both emphasizing that we need to amplify the voices of women who are in these positions of being um, silenced, and and you say in in your article on this that uh, you know truth telling about the misogynistic discrimination and femicidal violence of the shadow pandemic requires including and understanding that torture is a distinct form of violence that is inflicted in the domestic private sphere. You say this requires specific acknowledgement. So women and children will be understood when reaching out for help. You also make other crucial points around policy, saying that Canada needs to develop indicators that raise public uh, warning alerts, studying, for example, how the domestic violence disclosure scheme known as Claire's Law in the UK and Wales works. You have all of these incredible ideas, I think, that could be not just moving for people, but transformative for society. Uh, I can't tell you how much... Uh, you know, I'm sort of stricken by your tireless thinking and activism. I'm so grateful for you making the time to talk to me. It's actually my son's 12th birthday. And I am i have to say, I feel incredibly fortunate and proud uh, to have him as a son. He is the most tender-hearted, caring kid in the world. He is a selfless, just like incredibly loving person. I, I feel like he is he is um, a feminist to his core in the sense that he believes in caring and really hates all is, is outraged by any sort of bullying forms of domination, microaggression, all of that stuff really sickens him. He just doesn't have a mean bone in his body. See, that's, that's the evidence that says we don't have to maintain 
a social construction the way it is. Evidence that we see over and over and over again. So that's what why we have to be persistent and say that we can change. We can change. We do not have to go down this road mm -hmm. any longer. That's my determination, I keep thinking. Linda and I talk about the evidence we see in young people that it's possible, it's possible, it's possible. And to value caring. I think that's the that's the message that the ultimate message that Jean and I bring is we always stress that there's immeasurable value in caring, that our actions are based and rooted in caring, I think, because we're nurses and just because we know the, the power of caring. You know, even in inquiry, I see it as a caring act because it's lessons learned and, and reshaping our, our uh, culture. And that's, that's a caring act. It doesn't have to be seen as an authoritarian process if it's done properly. So, you know, if we can find ways to care about each other and move forward in this world, then young people have, you know, they've found the answer to more quality in life. I cannot thank you enough. Well, thank you, Scott, your contribution, like our contribution and other people's contribution is, is critical to transformation.